Hello, people on the Beanie Pipes. I'm Mr. Spork, and these are Mr. Spork's hands. I want to talk to you today about making your own hummus from scratch at home. Anybody can do this, even if you don't have access to tahini. I can get you around that problem. Don't worry. Hang on. I know that the hummus marketing machine has reached a fever pitch when I can walk into my local backwoods grocery store and find no fewer than a dozen different makes and models and permutations on the shelves, all kinds of different shapes and sizes of containers and different flavors and such, all kinds of craziness around hummus. Even though hummus has been around for millennia in other food cultures, it's really, really going nuts in the grocery stores in North America. If you want a 300 gram pack of say a cup and a half of hummus at the local grocery store, they want to charge me six dollars for that. Six bucks for a cup and a half. You know, I can eat that much in one sitting, quite frankly. And even if you twiddle your thumbs and wait around until they slap a half off sticker on it because it's about to expire, that's still three bucks for 300 grams. I can do triple that volume, almost 900 grams worth of hummus for less than 50 cents. It is that cheap if you make it yourself soaked from dry beans. About those other flavors, they're doing some interesting stuff there at least. I've seen uh, roasted garlic, I saw one with a side packet of um, uh, tzatziki, the yogurt uh, cucumber sauce, that's really good. I saw one with harissa made with uh, fresh red chilies, you see it with sumac, all kinds of interesting flavors. But if you can make the basic plain version, you can then go nuts with any kind of flavors you want. To make the basic, what you're going to need is dry garbanzo beans, They're called chickpeas or CCPs, all kinds of different names for them. They come obviously like this, hard as rocks like all beans are when they're dried. You want to sift through them real quick. Our evil robot overlords have not figured out a way to catch every last rock. Nothing to worry about, but give them a quick look. I think in 10 years of making beans from dry, I found a total of three rocks. So don't panic, but give them a quick inspection. I do have 300 grams in here today. That's going to soak up to around 700 grams of finished beans, cooked beans in the end. And that's a good size for me because I take half of that, turn that into hummus, which is about what I can eat in a few days. And then the other half of beans, while I'm going ahead and cooking some anyway, I put them on salads and I make my own fresh uh, falafel with them. If you want to see a falafel video, leave me a message. I'll uh, whip that one up for you sometime soon. But that's a good size to start with. 300 grams of uh, dry beans is going to soak up into 700 grams worth of cooked beans. Uh, you want to cover them with about double their volume of water, at least, if not three or four times. I mean, you, you can't put too much water on them. And a lot of times people will say, well, you know, I, I, I don't know if I can remember to do that. I don't know if I want beans. I can't think ahead. Well, don't worry about that. If you soak these beans for, let's say, 24 hours at most, and you decide, hey, I want a pizza or something different that night, you can drain them, leave them in a metal container on the bottom shelf of your fridge, uncovered. Don't cover them up, don't put them in plastic, just leave them the, the air circulation from the refrigerator will kind of dehydrate them a little bit, but that's okay. You can leave them in that soaked but not yet cooked stage. I've left them in there for up to two weeks, but realistically you can leave it in there for a week until you really are ready to cook beans. It's so simple. So instead of thinking, I want beans tomorrow, think on a Sunday afternoon, do I want beans at some point in the next week? Go ahead and take the 15 seconds to cover a bowl with water, soak them, and you're ready to go whatever night you want them. That's what I need to do now. I'm going to go fill this with water. Okay, well covered with water. I want to talk to you about a trick that comes from bean culture that has preceded us, and it has to do with keeping your beans firm or softening them both in the soak as well as the cook. Hummus culture, uh, if you go back and read all the old recipes, you see that a lot of times they will add baking soda to the soaking water as well as to the cook. And the reason they do that, on the pH scale from acid at one end and alkali on the other, the acid end of the spectrum will tend to make beans firmer. That's why you don't put things like tomatoes or vinegar in initially when you're cooking beans. You usually add those sorts of things half an hour into the cook. On the other end of the spectrum, alkali will tend to make the beans soften a lot more easily makes the skins break up. A lot of times people will go to the trouble to uh, fish out or de-skin their gambanzos after they've uh, been soaked. I don't even bother because I've got a powerful enough blender and it's just never been a problem for me. So I don't mess with it. But if you really want them to uh, come off and if you want those beans to, to soften, you need to add just a tiny little bit of baking soda, both to the soak as well as the cook. Now, in this case, for that measure of beans, I don't know, we've got probably, what, two or three liters worth of total volume there. I'm going to go ahead and put in almost a full teaspoon of baking soda. That's okay because we're going to drain this water back off. You're not going to get any weird flavor flavors from that much baking soda in the soak. I'll do another measure when I go to cook them, but it'll be a lot less. So there is your acid versus alkali, soft beans versus firm beans trick for the day. Add a little bit of baking soda, your garbanzos will soften that much more. Going to give these about, oh, I don't know, 10, 15 hours, something like that. I'll come back and show you how to proceed. 
As you can see, we have soaked up nicely after uh, several hours. It's been about, oh, I don't know, 15 hours for me. You could certainly uh, do this in the morning when you're leaving for work uh, and come back eight or 10 hours later. That's probably enough for most beans. Garbanzos can be a little tricky in that they need a little bit more time. So if you can remember the night before, it's just that much better. And you can, of course, soak them up to uh, 24 hours without any uh, harm done. Uh, as I've got the baking soda in this soaking water, I want to make sure to get all of that off. So let me go transfer with my super sifter into a pot and fresh water. Here we are with a fresh batch of water on top of those beans. Always at least double cover the beans. Give them plenty of room to do their thing so you're not... Uh, packed in there too tight. Uh, for the exact same reasons that I put baking soda in the soaking water, the alkali versus acid question, I'm going to put a little bit of baking soda into the cooking water, but I don't want to use quite as much. I'm going to use about a half a teaspoon this time. And the reason is that we are actually going to use this cooking water in the recipe for making the hummus. So I don't want to go nuts with that measure uh, in the cooking water because it would concentrate down and give you that kind of weird flavor. The exact same story goes for salt. If you're going to use the cooking liquid in your recipe, go a little easy on the salt. In this case, I'm going to do, let's call it uh, three quarters of a teaspoon of salt during the cook. If I was going to drain the beans completely and use them in a different recipe, maybe on a salad or something like that, I'd probably salt a little bit heavier, kind of like um, cooking pasta. But while those beans come up to the boil, let's talk about the dangers of cooking dry beans. There's going to be people, possibly people funded by the canned bean industry, I don't know, uh, that will tell you that there is a dangerous chemical to be found in dry beans, and technically they are right. It's something called phytohemagglutinin, try to say that three times fast, and it exists in a lot of beans, but it is most common in kidney beans. Red kidney beans have the highest concentration of it. And yes, if you were to ingest it, it would probably make you uh, sick to your stomach, give you some cramps, uh, diarrhea, nauseous, uh, that sort of thing. But it's nothing that's going to need medical treatment. Uh, it would resolve itself in a few hours. But you don't have to worry about any of that. Don't panic. It's not going to kill you. The trick is that you have to cook your beans properly. And all that means to get rid of the phytohemagglutinin is that you have to cook them longer than 30 minutes. If you boil them for longer than 30 minutes, absolutely not a problem. It's all gone. It's what they're doing at the factory for the canned beans. It's not like they've got special phytohemagglutinin-free beans. Uh, they've just cooked them properly. If you cook yours properly, you won't have any problem. Quite frankly, you'd have to cook them uh, very uh, short of being tender. You'd probably have to really chew on them if they were still soft enough to have any of the dangerous chemicals. Don't let any pe bean panickers out there, don't let any fake bean news <laughs> get you all in a panic about cooking dry beans. Just cook them long enough and you'll be fine. So my beans are up to a boil here, as you can see. I'm just going to drop them down a couple of notches for a low simmer. As you can see, this foam has formed on top, and that happens with a lot of different kinds of beans. It's just a protein coming to the top and the surface. Some people will say that it's got a little bitter taste. I find that it depends on your batch of beans. Sometimes it's bitter, sometimes it makes no difference. But if you want to come in here and scoop it off, you absolutely can. You might have to do that one or two times in the first 10 or 15 minutes. I'm going to let these cook for uh, at least 45 minutes or so. As you can see, the skins came off thanks to the baking soda trick. Uh, they look really ugly right now, but don't worry. They will blend down to completely smooth if you use the right machine. I use a food processor. Could you do this with an immersion blender or an upright blender? You probably could, but if you're making a, a relatively big batch, um, you're probably going to want to go into the food processor with it. I've already got uh, three cloves of garlic because I'm kind of a garlic nut in there. I've already minced them. I do take the time to use my ancient but reliable garlic press. I will be the first to tell you that a garlic press is probably not the most required tool in your kitchen, but I bought this in 1982 for five bucks and it's given me that kind of useful life. So I think it's probably served its purpose. Uh, if you don't have a garlic press, you could use a big flat rock from the garden. You could use your big kitchen chef's knife and go nuts with it. Or you could use the gourmet Canadian garlic press. You could use a hockey puck and just bash the heck out of it like that. And there you go. That's going to get it down as far as you need. Hockey pucks are incredibly useful. I've got four of them underneath the legs of my couch because they raise it just the right amount. So get your garlic mashed however you're going to mash it with whatever device 
get that into the food processor. I do go ahead and mash it ahead of time, even though the, the food processor could probably handle it. Uh, every now and then I've had an escapee that somehow manages to avoid the blades. I don't know how it does that, some kind of a stunt garlic. So uh, four cloves of garlic in here for this much uh, beans, uh, a clove of garlic for every 150 grams or so. In goes my beans. Um, I'm not putting any of the liquid in yet because I don't know how much I need. We need to get some more flavors in here though. And for that, um, for me, it's always been cumin. Cumin is the answer to making that little secret something in your hummus. Now, a lot of people will tell you in um, certain cuisines that they automatically wholesale toast their cumin seed first. And in this case, I am going to pre-toast it a little bit, but I don't think that's always necessary. Sometimes if you want a bolder, broader uh, cumin flavor, you go with the untoasted. But what I've done here is, I hope you can see the difference there. Let me see if that shows up. Uh, I just toasted the uh, uh, cumin in a dry pan for oh, 35, 45 seconds, something like that, just until you smell it. If uh, you start to see it pop all over the place, you've probably gone too far. So pull it off of that. No oil, nothing in the pan, just a dry pan. But um, some people would use these seeds whole in there, and they like that texture. Personally, I like to grind mine down. So ground toasted cumin. Uh, that's a good teaspoon that I've got in there. Let me get this ground down for you. So one teaspoon of freshly ground, freshly toasted cumin. Make sure you toast it right before you use it, too, because once you toast it, you've really started a, a, a clock working on its flavor release. Mm, it just smells... It's cumin, but it's also um, uh, woody and toasty and warm. It's just a fabulous spice. So in that goes without any worry. I am going to want to get some salt in there, but I'm going to do the salt last because I don't know exactly how much salt I've got in the cooking liquid. So uh, going to need some fat in there for good hummus. I've got uh, gone ahead and grab my olive oil bottle for this. I'm going to go one, two, three four teaspoons to start. Uh, the beans need that little bit of extra cream in it, fat for creaminess to come out. And of course, the other ingredient in hummus is uh, tahini, sesame paste. But up here in my weird corner of Canada, people don't really know what tahini is. They don't know how to use it. Uh, the few bottles that you see on the store shelves that have been there for a long time. And so I use a substitute that you can find anywhere. I use peanut butter. Yes, peanut butter will give you the same um, uh, taste profile as tahini in this context, but you cannot use the same measure. Uh, usually for hummus, it's probably around a four to one ratio of beans to tahini paste. If you try four to one, it's going to taste like peanut butter. So I only use about a third of the measure that I would normally use um, of tahini with uh, peanut butter. This is 100% peanut, peanut butter, though extra sugar. Don't buy um, the stuff for your kids, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches in this context. I'm going to do, uh, this is probably a tablespoon, what have I got in there? I've got, I'm, I'm going to call this two tablespoons that I've got in there as a start. Again, ease up into it. Mm, there we go. And of course, we've got to get some lemon juice, the acid that we want. Uh, I've got uh, three tablespoons here, but I'm not going to use all of it. I just want to have some on standby. I'm going to use about a tablespoon and a half to start. And now we need to let the machine do its job. Now let's see how we're doing there. As you can tell, it's not quite as thin as you want. So this is where we go in with some of our cooking liquid. That's going to thin it out just the right amount. I've got, oh, I don't know, what is that, four, three or four tablespoons in there. And I can tell it's going to want just a little bit more oil. Let's put another teaspoon of oil. I should say that if you aren't a fan of cumin, that's kind of my twist on it. There are certainly other options. You could absolutely just do plain old black pepper. You don't have to put anything in there at all other than maybe a little salt. Uh, you could do sumac, which is a traditional topping on the top, but it's very nice blended in. Sumac's got kind of a bright cranberry flavor. You could absolutely use a beautiful mild chili pepper. I would normally say to use uh, some of the fabulous Aleppo pepper, but sadly Aleppo pepper, because of the unrest in the region, is next to impossible to find, so you have to cross a few borders over to Turkey and get either the Maresh or the Urfa pepper, something along those lines. You can even go to uh, the Pyrenees and use Espelette, just a mild chili flake. That would go well in there. And what I'm watching here, which I can't really show you with the lid off, I'm watching as it's blending the uh, consistency, as it's uh, smoothing out in the blender. But that is right about where I want it. 
We are going to need a little bit of salt, a little bit more salt in there, I should say. But I'm doing that last. So this is a, uh, I'm going to do, let's call that a, a quarter teaspoon, half teaspoon, something like that, just to get me going. Always sneak up on it. Don't put in too much because <laughs> you will not be able to get it out. You'd have to go cook yourself another 300 grams of garbanzos to even it out. Mm. I think we're there. I think that is absolutely beautiful hummus, ready to go. Fresh made, you're in control of everything that's in there. So look at this. It's nice and fresh and fluffy. It's not that dense pack stuff that you get in the grocery store. I've got almost a kilo of this that I just made. It is at least 50 cents, if not cheaper, probably more like 35 cents. It's like 25 cents worth of beans in there. Please make it yourself. You saw how easy it is. You get to control the flavors that are in there. You get to make it your own personal dip. If you invite me to your parties, I'll show up with a kilo of fresh made hummus. I do appreciate you liking and thumbs up and in Tweety book space and in Instagramming and all that other social media stuff that just befuddles me. If you haven't, please do subscribe because those subscription numbers are important to us YouTubers now since they've got minimum standards. And as always, if you can take 30 seconds to watch the ad that runs after this, they throw a few pennies in my pocket and I greatly appreciate that because it lets me keep doing this for you. Until next time, I'm Mr. Spork. These are Mr. Spork's hands and now I gotta go make some pitas to go with this beautiful hummus. Cheers.